Uh, two explorers were on a jungle safari when suddenly a ferocious lion jumped in front of them. Keep calm, the first explorer whispered. Remember what we read in that book on wild animals. If you stand perfectly still and look the lion in the eye, he will turn and run. Sure, replied his companion. You've read the book, and I've read the book, but has the lion read the book? <laughs> you know, do you, do you ever find yourself uh, telling your fear or your temptation that? You know, I know what God's word says. I shouldn't be afraid, but fear, do you recognize what the word says? I, I know I shouldn't be participating in this behavior, doing this thing, but have you read the word and do you know what it says? Um... That is really the crux of the issue for the Israelites as they sit poised to enter the promised land. Are we going to believe what God has said or are we not going to? I mean, ultimately, that's where we left them a couple of weeks ago in the, in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. Uh, remember, for the past several weeks, barring last week, uh, we used their situation to think about our own promised land. The blessings and the kind of life God sets before us and welcomes us to enter in. I suggested personal intimacy with God, Holy Spirit directed and empowered living. ...as essential parts of what God offers us and calls us to. But you know something, those really are cast in general terms. I believe in some ways God has an individual promised land for each of us. Certainly there's a general will of God that is in the Word, and I think whenever we talk about our Christian lives, we start with that. I think as we live in the general will of God and the obedience He calls us to, that actually serves as the foundation for whatever specific will He might have. But you can, you're, you're free when it comes to godly purposes and godly goals to think of your own promised land. And again, are you going to enter into that? Are you going to, with faith and with obedience and with your choice, pursue the thing that God ultimately is calling to you? I mean, ultimately, that is a question that is, uh, that is, uh, is always before us in terms of are we going to follow God where He's leading us to a land of milk and honey? You know, remember, that land isn't going to be without battles. It's not going to be without conflicts. It's not going to be without problems. You know, that's what's amazing about the promised land of God. It's not like he's talk, talking about a bliss. He's not talking about something where there's no uh, problematic situation to be faced. But what those situations ultimately provide is an opportunity for him to work. So whatever uh, uh, enemies might be there, whatever giants are in the land, the things that we have to confront, God is just saying, hey, come with me to face them and let me show off. Let me show you who I am. Let me show you how wise and powerful and loving and gracious and righteous I am in confronting the things that we confront. And so basically, again, the question is, are we going to continue on? You know, as I thought about even last week's message, and we look at unbelievers and we, you know, as we think about the things that they're offended by in terms of the Christian faith. You know, we, when we had the cross and we, we looked at what is offensive about the cross that would cause an unbeliever not to press into salvation. Well, the sad analogy is the fact that sometimes we as believers, we are also offended by God. We're also protective of ourselves. We also don't pursue Him in the way that He desires in terms of how we follow in obedience and in and, and worship and, and again, just, just laying our lives before Him in terms of where He's leading. I mean, ultimately, if you're already in Numbers 14, I hope you are, uh, let's see what result comes to the Israelites. Again, as they're poised to go into the Promised Land, but then fail in disbelief and not following God. It says in first verse four, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children would be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should just choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Um, do you see what disbelief creates? What it fosters in our hearts? I mean, all this grumbling and blaming and complaining and hopelessness and assigning evil intent to God. That ultimately the Israelites aren't saying the problem is ours. 
The problem is God's. The problem is Moses. If you hadn't just led us here, our lives would have been great. Why did you take us out of Egypt in the first place? Again, that's the kind of things that happens when, again, we, we set aside faith. We don't believe God. We don't press into the things that He has for us. See, we're, that in some ways, that's all we're left with. See, once we don't have God's glory, we don't have God's promised land, God's provision for our lives, and we're left to ourselves to figure out what to do, to figure out how to live life, how to figure out how to negotiate through relationships and deal with suffering and deal with problems, and we're on our own, well, of course you're going to complain. Of course you're going to blame. It's of course you're going to talk about how victimized you are about life and there's nothing you can do about this or that. See, that's the condition outside of God. But in God, there's always solution. There's always a path. There's always power. There's always provision. But ultimately, that is what God is walking us in. See, I think we have to be careful when this sentiment becomes a sentiment of our hearts. When we find ourselves complaining like this, blaming God. Again, blaming other people in terms of the situation we find ourselves in. I think we have to be careful when people we're around start talking like this. When you associate yourself with people that are complainers and blamers and the people that are pointing fingers and don't believe God. I mean, Satan loves to encourage this pattern of thinking. This, this, this is the pattern that he started right from the beginning. Did God really say that? Is that really God's intent? God doesn't have things for you. He's against you. He's trying to keep you from something. You should just handle this in your way. You should take the matters under your own control in terms of what direction your life is going to go in. You shouldn't believe God. Again, there's going to be that influence inside us. There's going to be that influence in the spirit realm. There's going to be influence like that in the world. And we as believers, again, are the ones who reject that. We set that aside. We press in faith and continue to believe in a God that is greater than ourselves and greater than the problems that we face. I mean, just look at the juxtaposition, the comparison that is here. You know, I... I always look for opportunities to use that word. If you've been here long enough, you know. Juxtaposition is a fancy word. You know, you want a 25-cent word to use around the water cooler at work if they even have water coolers anymore. But anyway, you use juxtaposition. It's two things set side by side for the sake of comparison. And look at what we have in verse 5 through 9. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly. Gathered they gathered there, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, Jephune, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is, go their, their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. I mean, do you see the comparison between the blamers and complainers, the ones that don't believe God, that are looking from their own vantage point, looking from their own uh, resources to start with dealing with the situation? But then what comes from a person that believes in God, that believes in power, and believes in something greater? See, that's what God is welcoming us to, but it's going to take faith. It's going to take will. It's going to take choice. Say, God, yes, I do believe you, and I will follow. I mean, you need to thank, well, well basically, I think this picture in verses 5 through 9 is really a picture of what the righteous do in the presence of the falsehood. I mean, they confront falsehood passionately, with great conviction. They present a vision of God. I mean, we should be thankful for people in our lives that do this. If you have someone in your life that sees you straying away, going down a wrong path, complaining a little, gossiping a little, lusting a little, greedy a little, whatever it is, and they come in your life and say, wait, stop. Don't, don't keep going down this road. This is what God wants. This is what God is leading to. Go in this direction. Be grateful for those people. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That's what the book of Proverbs tells us. 
See, I also think another part of this is the fact that we should look to be that for other people. So we shouldn't just be in a position saying, boy, I hope people come and encourage my life. Well, what about you encouraging someone else's life? And you'll be amazed that when you try to process why someone else should be encouraged, you'll be amazed at how encouraged you become. Because now all of a sudden you have to think more deeply about God and the things you believe and the things you know and then spurt it out in an understandable way to someone else. So by definition you understand it more. But again, we should look to do that for other people. And I think even more importantly, we, get to, we need to get used to encouraging our own soul. You've heard me say that before, but it's such a crucial thing for us to understand that we are responsible for the thoughts that come into our hearts. We are responsible for the things that leave our hearts, the things we say to people, the, the way we dump things on people, the way we criticize people, the fact that all that stuff starts with anger or hatred or bitterness inside us. I mean, what a great provision of God to be able to take thoughts captive. To have things come into our hearts and realize, you know something, that's just wrong. I mean, there was a couple of Mondays ago where I'm just, you know, doing my Monday thing, Mondays are my day off, so I'm probably burning stumps or doing yard work or paint, whatever I was doing. And there was just an anxiety that came over me. Don't know where it was from, wasn't really necessarily attached to, to anything, but I just felt burdened and laid down with this anxiety. But what did I do? Did I say, boy, why should I be anxious? Let me press into that worry and remind myself why I should be afraid? No, I thought of God and His Word and what, how He frees us from anxiety, how God is more powerful than any of this. Basically looking at the things that maybe if there's something in this that God is bringing before me that I'm responsible for and I need to press into obedience and learning or maturity myself, but then certainly casting things on God in terms of whatever I might be anxious about that He ultimately should take care of and casting those cares on Him because He cares for me, then leaving them with Him. But again, the, the biggest lesson that I learned and what was practically you know, kind of very, very uh, palatable and concrete in terms of my experience is again, me managing my soul. My looking at that anxiety and saying, this is not of God. God does not want me to continue to press into and live in a state of anxiety. He doesn't want me to consistently live in a state of unbelief or, or disobedience or whatever it would be in terms of things that are against God, against the Word, discrediting Him in terms of His character or His plan, but to recognize we have a role to encourage ourselves. See, it's great to encourage other people. It's great to have other people encourage us. But just imagine if you're the one, like you're the Joshua in your own life. You're the Caleb in your own life. That there's enough doctrine, there's enough truth in your soul of what God's word is where you're tearing your own clothes, saying, stop this, Peter. Stop this, David. Stop this, Michelle. Don't, don't go here anymore. Where ultimately we recognize ourselves with passion and conviction. To don't, don't go, don't continue in a path that is against God. I mean, do you see it? Do you see the passion that Moses and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua have? Don't you see God for who he is? Stop fussing about yourself. Stop focusing on yourself. Stop making it about you because that's where you're losing. <laughs> that's where you're ultimately giving up when, again, you're, you're focused on yourself, so therefore you're left with just your resources. See, don't be ignorant of Satan and sin's devices. I mean, don't, I mean, realize you have an enemy. There is an enemy inside you. There is an enemy in the kingdom of darkness that is trying to get you away from God. He's trying to steer you in a wrong path. He's trying to uh, shoot arrows into your soul of thoughts that are inconsistent with the word of God. And we just have to be the kind of people that, like Moses and Aaron, like Joshua and Caleb, are saying, no, we don't go there. We're not going to let that discourage us. I think that is why the Word is so important. You know, and I'm talking about daily interaction. 
in terms of just a consistent interaction with the Word, so the Word is the thing that our lives are oriented to. See, to me, what the Word does is it orients us to God. It orients us to His power. It orients us to His person. It orients us to His law. It, it, it orients us to the provisions that He has. See, it's, it's, it's the tool by which I take thoughts captive. And so, one of the value of having that tool is that when we have a daily interaction with that, now we're availing ourselves of that tool all the time. And, and that word that we're reading and engaging with on a daily basis is fueling and empowering and encouraging the word that I've read last week and the month before. It all goes together. But I'll get, I'll get to that, into that more later on in our passage where it will become more important. But just realize how important having the word in your soul allows you to be your own Joshua, your own Caleb, your own Moses and Aaron, encouraging your own soul in terms of the things that come against you. See, ultimately, without the Word, you are dead in the water. Without the Word, you are just vulnerable. You're just a target. I mean, just... I mean, to the extent that you're a believer, like, you, you've gone on a limb in terms of the dynamics of the, the spiritual conflict between God and Satan... Where God is trying to bring His glory to bear. He's trying to manifest Himself to, to, in terms of the faith we have. In terms of the people that are, are, are building their lives up in Him. God is trying to encourage all that. Satan is trying to break that down. So ultimately, you put yourself out there waving your flag. Yeah, I'm a believer, but I'm not going to be strong. I'm not going to have faith. I'm not going to have the Word. But look, I'm waving the flag. People at work know that I love Jesus. I sing praises and say praise the Lord all the time. But now all of a sudden you're not in the Word. You don't, you don't have the food food to fuel your life in Christ. Well, Satan's going to have a hey, have a field day with you. In terms of just how he's going to be able to come in and corrupt your soul. Twist your thinking. Get you discouraged. Now all of a sudden the person that is waving the banner of Jesus is being disobedient. You're the one complaining. You're the one blaming. You're the one doing things wrong. And so just watch out for that in terms of, again, how, where we are in terms of our lives with Christ and why God is encouraging us. See, He wants us to press into what is good. But it is the good that He has for us. It's not the good of the flesh. It's not the good of excitement. It's not the good of excitement. But it's the good of our Creator. It's a good of what He can plan and what He can foster. And again, He's saying, come into it. But we have these two influences put before us that again, are active in our hearts, is active in our world. People that say, no, nope, don't go there. Can't trust God. Of course you can trust God. Look at it the way He describes it. But look at how the assembly responds to Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Just imagine that. Just imagine that. That here, like in our minds, we think Moses, well maybe not so Aaron, he made a lot of mistakes. But Moses and Joshua and Caleb, these heroes of our faith, the guys who have been faithful in God, and the people of Israel are saying, yeah, let's stone them. Yeah, that, that makes sense, right? But see, when, when the unbeliever or the believer that is not pressing into God is confronted with truth, there's two paths that they will go. They will either receive that conviction and start living in that conviction, or they'll try to silence it. And that's what the people are saying. saying we're offended by that, that that rubs us the wrong way, so the best thing to deal with it is just get rid of it. And what a sad description in terms of the, or, 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 or the state of the, of the Israelites' hearts in terms of doing that silencing the voice, silencing the voice of truth, silencing the conviction, we'll see things our way, thank you. But look at now when God shows up. It says here, but the whole assembly talked about stoning them, then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. Yeah, the jig is up. The, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a great nation, a nation greater uh, and stronger than they. 
You know, God gave the same offer to Moses after the golden calf incident. And he talked the same way in terms of like, don't, don't miss how God is orienting his behavior, his policies, his plan to the relative obedience of the people. So we have to understand that our obedience or disobedience affects God's plan. It doesn't affect God's character, but it does affect what he will do with us and to us. And just understand that when God reveals himself, when God blesses, when God makes a provision of, of showing you who he is, and then you reject that, then you walk away from that, that is not something that sits well with God. That, that, that's what this should tell us. You know, there is a, there's an Old Testament context to this. You know, we don't have the same kind of relationship that these Israelites have. You know, we are, we are bought with the blood of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit within us. To be honest with you, if you look at that in the Word, it goes two ways. In some ways, we're more blessed because of that. Like, 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 like God is in His mercy and His conviction and His way to work is different in terms of what He does internally, maybe more so what He does ex externally. But the other way that that plays out in the world is if you have something greater, you should be more obedient. So it's a both end. You're more blessed because you're in the church age. You're more blessed because you have the Holy Spirit. But in some ways now, you're more responsible in terms of that. And that's where we just have to understand. God is, God is describing himself here. He is giving a picture of kind of the, the way he is and the way he acts in terms of how he internalizes our disobedience, how he internalizes the things he does for us, and then his reaction to that. See, I don't think, gee, I don't think God is changing his character. I don't think God is like angry and upset, like, a, like I didn't know this was going to happen and I'm reacting to this, like we react in anger and, 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 and they kind of do things harshly because of that. But he is operating in truth. He is operating out of the context of his righteousness and, 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 and understanding the very reason why he has done these miraculous things is to draw them to him and ultimately when they treat him with contempt, with disdain, this is what comes from God. And I think we would understand that that's warranted in terms of how God would even treat us, but being aware that that's how God works. Now it's interesting as we continue on in this passage, we're going to see that God is going to allow and welcome conversation from Moses about his plan. See, we're going to see that Moses does not accept this offer from God. I mean, just imagine being Moses in this time frame. Where ultimately the people are disobedient. God comes to you and says, hey, Moses, let's make a deal here. I'll destroy all of them and just make you a new nation through you. I mean, how tempting would that be for us in terms of we become the grand poobah, we become the start of a new thing. But Moses rejects that. Moses is re revealing his humility in terms of just how he understands himself as a leader. That he's there for the people and not for himself. But the fact that God welcomes this conversation is a great indication of, again, the kind of God we have. That he, he, when he sometimes exposes his plan to us, he welcomes us to give defense and argument against it. That's exactly what's happening here. I think in some ways this is unique. I think in some ways this is a Moses thing. and He's the leader of Israel and no one is like him in terms of our lives. But there's also something not unique in terms of the opportunity we all have in praying to God where ultimately we are pressing into His will and into His plan in terms of what input we might have in that. I mean, ultimately the fact that God welcomes us, welcomes us and Moses into conversation reflects His love, His grace, and His just justice. I don't think we ever change the ultimate plan of God that's not up for discussion, but certain aspects of how it is carried out is. Don't miss that. It's not God's ultimate plan that is up for conversation, but how he cares, carries it out is. So look at Moses' response here in verse 13. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. 
They have already heard that you, O Lord, are with these people, and that you, O Lord, have been, have seen, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them, uh, before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death, that all at once the nations who have heard uh, this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the desert. Now, now, may, now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. And he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations in accordance with your great love. Forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from now or pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. I mean, this is a great description. If you were ever put in a position to have a conversation with God about what his plan, how his plan is going to be carried out, there's a lot of uh, key points that Moses relies on in terms of what he brings to God. Now, it's going to be very important for us to understand the balance that is here. I mean, ultimately, Moses is confronting an omniscient, sovereign, omnipotent God who already knows exactly what he's going to do, why he's going to do it, and, and, it's, and it's going to be good for all those who are willing to observe it in the way that he's accomplishing it. So we're not ultimately uh, pressing into God to change his mind or to, to uh, like, in, like make him do something he's not willing to do. But ultimately, God sometimes gives us this opportunity to engage in conversation with Him so we understand His plan better. That we internalize this information. Just think about what Moses has to think about God and understand about God to give this defense. See, Moses is expressing his maturity and his understanding of God's person in terms of what he says. And again, it's a good pattern for us. I think there are, there, are, there are character traits of what he says to God that are important for us. I think first, what we notice here is he points to God's reputation. You know, basically he says, you know something, God, if you do this, what are people going to say about you? That if ultimately the glory of God is what the, the whole point of creation is, that the whole point of creation is to manifest who God is, show who God is. Moses is giving this argument, God, look at, look at what this would make you look like in terms of the, the other nations uh, that, that uh, have observed your behavior, know that you're with us. So again, when we're thinking about coming before God, recognizing how important His glory is to Him, and how He cares about His reputation before men. But it's not like this insecure, oh my gosh, do people not like me? It's not that kind of thing. But, but God does have an intent. God does have a goal. That basically God says that my glory is the highest pursuit and I'm not going to share my glory with anyone else. Now God does not do that selfishly. He does that because that is the only thing that is true. The truest thing that God can say is everyone should praise me. Everyone should glorify me. That's the truest thing that he can say. So he's not doing it so he can be affirmed, so he can think good things about himself, that he'd be all insecure if we, all, we weren't all praising him. That's not why God says that. And that's not why God talks about his glory being the highest pursuit and the thing that he's not going to share with anyone. Because that is reality. For God to say anything different would be for God to lie. So the sooner we wake up to the reality that God's glory is the only glory that counts, we're ultimately going to be missing something. If we're pursuing a glory that's not about God's glory, we are, going, we are running contrary to the very state of reality. So now as God welcomes Moses and us into this conversation, again, not about his person, not about his ultimate plan, but how his plan will be carried out, as we're praying, as we're pressing into God in terms of the requests we bring, don't forget, God, how will you be glorified in this? What is the best way for you to be glorified? There, there are some times I'm praying for people, and it's hard for me to pray for their healing. Because you know something, in God's economy, to God's glory, healing would be the worst, worst thing to happen to this person. 
Because this person is prideful. They are pursuing a path that is of their own. And, and they've led their lives to destruction. So God's going to come in and heal them? Maybe they need not to be healed. So that they wake up and see what their destruction is. And repent. And do better. And follow another path. You know, and so, they, so that's all to say that when we're praying, when we're presenting our request to God, don't forget about, don't think about people's comfort. We all need nice, nice, doily lives. No, God, what is your glory in this? What is this going to accomplish in making you bigger and more obvious to other people? That's what Moses is talking about. The second thing Moses reminds God of is his promises. I and mean, when he says in verse 16 here, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. You know, in some ways I'm very glad that in our, in our Bible reading in, in, uh, on, on the website that I, always, I encourage all of you to become involved with. We're reading through the book of Genesis. And we're seeing how God makes this promise to Abraham. And that promise goes to Isaac. And that promise goes to all people, people Jacob. And then Jacob to the twelve tribes. And part of that promise is this land, is this territory. So part of what Moses is saying, hey, if you promise this to, to the patriarchs and you're not able to bring your people in, you're failing your promises. See, God loves it when we throw his word back at him. You know, something you'll notice in the book of Psalms, David is always reminding God of his promises. God, remember you said this? God, remember you said that? See, and God doesn't need to be reminded like he forgot. We need to be reminded of what he said. And that just becomes part of the precedent for our arguments. See, ultimately what we're doing is we are bringing argument to God, a defense to God. We are really returning to God everything that was his. Everything that is his. So my argument does not come from human reason or my vantage point. But ultimately our argument still comes from his vantage point. So one, he thinks about, points to God's reputation, he points to God's promises, and third, he reminds God of his character. I mean, basically he says, yes, you are righteous and worthy to be followed, but you're also merciful. So, so, so Moses, in describing his character, just don't miss the fact that he expresses this balance. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. It does not leave the guilty unpunished. I mean, that, that's the two aspects of how God's work. That's, that's the two aspects of God's character. We should always be hesitant when we're emphasizing one over the other. Oh, God, you're so merciful. Oh, God, you're so loving. Oh, God, you're so gracious. Yes, he is. To the full war, to the full amount that we need. But on the other side, God is one who deals with sin. God is the one who brings consequences or allows consequences to unfold. Is it going to free us from those things? And God is a God who will discipline his children. In the same way that we as parents recognize the discipline of children is important for their growth and their obedience, God does the same thing. But again, God called Moses here, and like us, I think it's a pattern for us, reminds God of who he is. And again, that reinforces what you know and what you believe about Him. So three important elements of conversing with God. The fact that we remind Him of His reputation, we uh, remind Him of His promises, we remind Him of His character. But we enter the conversation with, uh, we enter the conversation with God with the humility that is commensurate with coming before God. We engage with the confidence of bringing to God what He has revealed to us. And we leave with the peace to know that God will do what is best for all involved. Let me say that again, because that, this is really the capstone of all of this. That we come to the conversation with the humility that's commensurate with coming before God. Like, we're not pressing this case. We're not making this argument like, hey, you know something, God? You're going to listen to me. You sit down and you listen to me. I've got an opinion for you. No, 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 no. It's humble, God. Thank you for even welcoming me in the conversation. I don't have a right to even be here outside of Christ and the blood that was spilled. But you, you welcome me into the conversation. And even more so Moses here. Mo yeah, Moses, I'm, I'm doing something here, Moses, that you see... And maybe Moses is supposed to see, this really isn't what you want to do, God. So let me remind you of the reasons. But we come with humility of what it means to come before our great and sovereign God. 
but we engage with the confidence of bringing to God what He has revealed to us. God, I'm not coming with my ideas. I'm coming with your right. I'm just telling you who you are. You said you've made this promise. You, you, uh, you know what? Uh, you've got your character to think of. I, I want your glory. You want the same thing. See, we in prayer are not conquering God's reluctance. We are embracing His willingness. We are trying to find His willingness in terms of what He can accomplish and join Him in that. But we come with a level of confidence before God because we're bringing to Him what He has revealed to us. But then we leave with peace to know that God will do what is best for all involved. See, and that's important with the humility piece. Again, Moses has just made an argument. He's just said, hey God, you want my opinion? This is what I think. But the best thing for us to respond to that is say, but now God, whatever you want to do is fine. Because you're the one that's God. You're the one that's in control. And see, we are always better off to, in any aspect of Scripture, to press into greater obedience and worship of God than finding whatever discourage might, discouragement might be there. Like, you might interact with us and say, well, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem to be, like, what, 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 what I think should be true, or what I think should... See, that's where your opinion doesn't matter. What, if, not, what matters is what does, the, what does the Bible reveal about the kind of God we have and the kind of thing that He accepts. And again, the fact that God welcomes us into this conversation, but ultimately we leave with Him in terms of uh, what result or what He will accomplish. You know, I didn't, I didn't get to ultimately where we wanted to get to, but this is important stuff in terms of just uh, what is happening, on, uh, happening here, what it says about us in relation to God, what it says about God in terms of His character. I encourage any conversation or questions that you might have about this if there's any confusion, but ultimately, again, the, the, the whole dynamic of how we engage, how we perceive ourselves in the context of this conversation. Humility, confidence, and peace in terms of what, what happens from us. So let's follow on this point. Father, we just do thank you for, for another opportunity to see uh, the, just the welcome mat that you put out to humankind for conversation and discussion with you in terms of processing your will, processing how you will carry things out. And what, what, does, what that does say about your grace, about your love, about your justice, that, that, you, that you want us to have a part in that, and what a privilege that is. And so, Father, I just pray you guide us in our own praying. I mean, you guide us in our own request. And our, our request would be more about your glory and about your word and about your promises and about your character. And so, Father, I just pray that we just continue to grow and learn. And foremost, God, that we would just keep pressing in to what you are offering us, what you're welcoming us into. Father, we, we understand uh, the, the obedience you call us to, the faith you call us to, the challenge you call us to, but Father, all bearing fruits of, of, of righteousness and of love and of joy and of peace and of blessing that comes from you. And so we thank you that that balance is in you as God, where when you give us what we need, you, you provide for us a wholeness and fullness of life, but you call us to a life that, that is about you, uh, humbling ourselves before you so you can lift us up. And we thank you that we don't need to do that lifting ourselves, but you do that for us. And so, Father, I just uh, just come before you on, on just to, for all of us in terms of just what this word will develop and, and mature us in, in terms of our understanding of you as our great God. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, and we do pray.